once said, you need to know the past to understand the present. To which an idiot responded, to understand the M3, you need to understand where the M3 peaked and where the M3 came from and the importance of a badge. But you must never forget that the M3 actually came from a Mercedes. Since the dawn of time, there have only ever been six M3s. That's not a lot. There were seven wonders of the world, 10 commandments, 16 candles. And so a new M3 is a rare event indeed. And it's also a big deal because the M3 name ranks among the most important in the automotive universe. And every time a new one comes out, we hold it to a really high standard. And schmucks like me say, well, I'm not sure this is a real M3. Well, I'm not sure that's really fair to BMW, because if we look at what the M3 badge actually means, BMW only ever made one of them, and it was terrible. <laughs> this chassis is unbelievable! This thing is epic! It is so much fun! It buzzes your foot off, but man does that engine pull and pull and pull and pull! This feels like an old race car! Because, you know... When I said the E30 M3 was terrible, I sure as hell wasn't talking about its ability to dance across a racetrack. I was talking about the M3 as a consumer product, because a consumer product's primary goal is to sell, and the first M3 didn't. And for good reason. Look, in late 1987, $28,000 bought you a fully loaded Sport Pack 325 IS, which had the sweetest, most sonorous straight six in the world. Or for 20% more monies, you could have an M3. And those extra dollars bought you a downgrade to the buzz bombiest, nastiest, vibrating four cylinder. Oh, but the M was all about performance, you may say. Really? No. And I got the receipts. The M3 was dead even with the lighter 325 IS in skid pad slalom and braking tests. But surely it was quicker, right? Barely, this thing buzzed its way through the quarter mile two tenths of a second quicker than the 325 IS. So the M3 was sales proof, but, and this is a very big, very important but, the M3 genuinely wasn't designed to sell in big numbers. It wasn't meant to appeal to any 325i buyer. It had one goal and one goal only to beat that Mercedes. It may look like an old man sedan with an aftermarket wing and apologetic fender flares, but no. That Mercedes is the 190E 2316, and it debuted at the 1983 Frankfurt Auto Show and sold out immediately, having just returned from Nardo, where it set three different world and nine international endurance speed records, averaging 154 miles an hour over 50,000 kilometers. I don't think BMW really cared about the speed. Mercedes had always made fast cars, but this was different because the 190E was small. It was the same size as the 3 Series, the car that defines BMW. So the whole idea of a sports sedan from Stuttgart was basically Mercedes pissing in BMW's Cheerios. There is a common misconception that the 2.316 was a BMW copycat, but it went into production three years before the M3. The Mercedes 2.316 came first, and it wrote the recipe for the E30 M3. So if you love the M3 and everything it stands for, you have this Mercedes to thank. The year was 1977, 
And the idea of a small Mercedes had been thrown around Stuttgart boardrooms unsuccessfully for decades. But suddenly faced with fuel economy laws, the Mercedes board had no choice and finally approved a baby Benz. With a bunch of engineering requirements. Requirements so ridiculous that it seemed like the board was trying to stop the whole small car project from happening at all. The subcompact 190E had to offer the same crash safety as the full-sized S-Class. It had to offer the same ride quality as an S-Class. It had to be immediately identifiable as a Mercedes from the driver's seat, which is why, even though the 190 is smaller than any sedan on sale today, I literally can't touch the pedals with the seat all the way back. Oh, und there's one more thing, said the board. We only give you permission to build the W201 if it wins the world. <clears throat> what was that? The board was so concerned that no one would take a baby Ben seriously that it said they would only give permission to build it if it didn't just enter, but won the World Rally Championship. Who does that? To guarantee that win, there would be two WRC cars. The first would be the familiar sedan. The second, a short wheelbase hatchback optimized for tight stages. Mercedes hired Cosworth to engineer and build a 16-valve head for its new 2.3-liter four-cylinder and signed Walter Rural to drive the WRC cars. But just seven months later, Mercedes wrote a computer program. And their computer simulation told them that neither of the rear-drive Benzes would have a chance against Audi's brand-new Quattro. I mean, they could have just turned on the television and watched Audi kick the snot out of everybody else, but that's not the Mercedes way. That's too simple. Anyway, the board was furious about having wasted gazillions of dollars on the racing program, so out of spite, they killed it completely. And then they specifically prohibited any further development of the 16-valve engine. And then they instituted a company-wide complete ban on all motorsports. And you thought your boss was a jerk. What happened next was a delicious con job perpetrated against the vindictive board by some engineers. They shoved the Cosworth 16 valve into the sedan and pitched the whole thing internally as a Sport 190 that would, of course, have nothing to do with racing. The board fell for it and didn't seem to notice a whole bunch of things that looked a whole bunch like racing, including a race of 22.316s at the grand opening of the Nürburgring race track. Yeah, my hair, this is a race, but this is not a race car. Um, yeah, I have to go quickly and catch a bus. Of course, Mercedes did homologate the 16 valve into Group A racing as soon as the requisite 5,000 had been built. And this meant that privateers could enter it in DTM should they want to. Of course, management didn't seem to notice all the parts flying out the back door at AMG and other <clears throat> independent teams who were racing. Or maybe they just turned the other way because the 2.316 won its first DTM race and then its second. Don't know whether the board noticed that, but you can be absolutely certain BMW did. The retaliatory move that came next was breathtaking. And not just because it created the E30 M3, but because it marked the official start of the horsepower war that's still raging today. Going up against the Mercedes, the BMW engineers had a huge advantage in that they knew exactly where the target was. And the target for the streetcar was beat the Mercedes to 100 kilometers an hour by 0.2 seconds. And that's exactly what happened. This was a simple recipe though. BMW just took the old M10 block, which had proven itself in Formula One, punched it out to the same bore and stroke as the old M1 supercar, so that it could use the M1 supercar's four valve per cylinder head, and that was it. BMW didn't need no stinking Cosworth to make a 2.3 liter 16 valve racing engine, because it was BMW. But the chassis targets were not gonna be so easy. The BMW E30 and Mercedes W201 both went into production in 1982, 
but the E30 was an evolution of an evolution of the 2002, which dated back to the early 1960s. The Mercedes, on the other hand, was a cost-no-object, ground-up new car. Its rear suspension alone cost 100 million Deutschmarks to engineer, probably more than BMW spent developing the entire E30. So getting the M3 to beat the Benz was not going to be an easy task, especially where aerodynamics were concerned because the wedge-shaped Benz had a huge aero advantage. Look, we all know the E30 is an aerodynamic brick, but the M3 wasn't. There are literal dozens of changes to this car for aerodynamics, most of which are so subtle you wouldn't notice them, except those at the back. Look, the regular E30 has a trunk lid that's down here. For aerodynamics, BMW needed to raise it up to give it the same kind of wedge shape that the Mercedes had. So what did they do? They placed a 1.6 inch tall cap on the trunk lid to fake it out. And then to get the air to come around the roof line and get into the spoiler where it could work, they needed to change the attack angle on the rear glass. The regular E30's glass is over here. It follows this line. The M3's is here at a much greater angle, and this is all fake. This is a cap that they put on to cheat the wind, which is pretty ghetto fabulous, if you ask me. And the changes didn't stop just at aero. They went to structure, too. BMW bonded in the glass for structural rigidity. Describing the changes to the E30's body for aerodynamics and strength have filled books, but the engineering didn't end when the M3 debuted. By the time the box-flared E30 was granted FIA Group A homologation in 1987, BMW was already producing the first of its M3 Evolution models. And the M3 wasted no time before clobbering everything in its path. It too won its first DTM race, but it didn't stop winning until it won the whole 1987 season. Mercedes management didn't find this funny, but now there was a new guy in charge and he embraced motorsports. So you can imagine his official response was, get them! Two months after BMW's season win, Mercedes finally jumped in as an official factory-backed effort. Over the next few years, the volley back and forth between BMW and Mercedes cost more than most small countries' GDPs. The result? Three Evolution model BMWs and two Evo Benzes, culminating in the incredible M3 Sport Evo and the outrageous 190E 2.516 Evo 2, the latter of which spurred some of the best stand-up comedy to ever come out of Germany. Audi's always professional boss, Ferdinand Piëch, said it looked like it had antlers on its ass. And then BMW's head of R&D publicly called the wing, and I quote, totally stupid, joking that the laws of aerodynamics must be different between Munich and Stuttgart, and then said, well, if that wing works, we're going to have to redesign our wind tunnel. BMW redesigned its wind tunnel. In addition to the road cars, this one-upmanship created some of the most spectacular racing of all time, with the wail of 10,000 RPM engines bouncing off stadiums that were packed with spectators, to say nothing of the literal 150 million people who watched it all unfold on TV. But what actually made the racing so compelling is that you could own these cars. And I, um, do. I own this car, it's mine. And maybe I'm a little bit biased, but this is the best balanced front engine rear wheel drive car I have ever had the pleasure of drifting around a track. It's epic. Look at this. This engine makes power all the way to 7,000 RPM, at which point it actually vibrates less than an M3 switched off. Everyone gets this car wrong because of the way it looks. The steering is communicative, the brakes are amazing, and it feels way faster than that M3. Except it's not. Move that pretentious fat ass out of the way. Randy, the 2.316 weighs 12 pounds less than the M3. I wasn't talking about your car, Jason. Idiot. 
sets the kind of standards we wish today's cars could set. Yeah, you're gonna get a Mercedes star up your wazoo. <laughs> oh, there's something so satisfying about racing an SCCA Hall of Famer and keeping up in a, what was that? Pretentious fat ass machine? <laughs> Whoa, breaking zone. is a joy. It just revs and revs and revs. And for goodness sakes, there's nobody electronically driving this car. I'm doing it all on my own. These cars are identical in terms of speed. He's got a little more on the straight, but in the corners, sorry Randy. <laughs> Gear, set the nose down into a corner, roll the power on the exit. Just don't want to stop. He's right on my ass. Surprise that 190 is keeping up. So the only thing left to do is get the fastest man in the world and have him set a lap time in each of the cars. Already did. Mercedes is faster. Ha! Start it up. But not by much. It's only three quarters of a second. A win is a win. Same day, same driver, same exact tires. Both cars had brand new Fredestein Sprint Plus tires in their original size. Hmm. Funny, I, I never considered the 190 a performance car. I'm shocked it'll keep up with an E30 M3. It really shouldn't surprise you that these two cars are as close as they are. After all, they were both answers to the same racing rule book. But where the street cars are concerned, it's safe to say that BMW emerged the victor. Because after all, BMW still makes an M3. Ultimately, Mercedes and BMW each took home two manufacturer's titles. But with factory backing from the get-go, the M3 won the numbers game. With no other cars even close behind them, the M3 won 48 races to the 190's 42. Not only does that make the E30 M3 the winningest touring car of all time, BMW won our hearts by continuing the M3 legacy. It must be said, the E30 stands alone as the only race car in the M3 lineage. Its replacement was no such thing. Instead, for the next two generations, BMW figured out how to graft the charms of a race car into a street car that you could just about live with every day, but that had top dog performance at a price that actually made sense to buyers. This is the magic recipe that combined the best of all worlds. I mean, look at it. It's perfect. If you ask me, peak M3 is the E46. It has everything. That engine. Yes. <laughs> this car that you're in something special. If BMW made an E30 M3 today, no one would buy it. So I think it's a little unfair to hold any car to that standard. No, no. This is the standard we should be holding all M3s to because the E46 M3 sold like the Dickens. It was the perfect recipe. And then BMW changed it. The recipe changed dramatically when the fourth gen M3 debuted. The E90 was far less a compact DTM car for the street than it was a supercar slaying executive express that did basically everything better than any other car. That's hardly a bad thing, but that sounds like an M5. And the F80 that followed tried to do everything well and succeeded at mostly none of it. And that brings us to the new generation of M3, which is bigger than the first three generations of M5. 
Look, I get it, German cars keep getting bigger and bigger. But this generation of 3 Series didn't just get bigger, it jumped an entire size class. And the 3 Series changed in its mission, too. Used to be that the 3 Series was a cheaper, more fun-to-drive alternative to things like, I don't know, a Mercedes. BMW has gone full hog into technology and luxury, to the point where a 3 Series is no more communicative and no less isolated than anything it competes against. And that leaves the M3 in a bit of a pickle. <clears throat> Without these outrageous seats, this interior, well, it just doesn't look like a sports sedan interior. And without that shifter, you might not realize this is just a regular old torque converter automatic. And without tons of fake engine noise coming from the stereo speakers, you wouldn't hear a thing. Trust me, I know, I pulled the fuse. These are all great things for a luxury car. But when the 3 Series doesn't much resemble a 3 Series, what chance does the M3 have at feeling like a motorsport version of the 3 Series? comes with a drift analyzer that rates your slide on a scale of one to five stars, presuming the airbags don't go off at the end of it. It would be a silly gimmick, except with a chassis this good, it's just icing on an already perfect cake. This steering is dead, but it is so precise, and there is no body motion. You turn in, the car turns in as a whole, you'd never know it weighed four and a half thousand pounds. Suspension tuning is dead on. Look at that balance! And it's just perfectly neutral all the time. BMW has nailed this chassis, period. It's as good to drive as it is horrible to look at. That's saying something. <laughs> That's it? Four and a half stars! I mean, I know this whole thing is a gimmick and all, and I think it's stupid, but I just got four and a half stars on a drift, and I gotta take a picture of this. I'm sorry, that's probably not safe to uh, do that while I'm driving. Yes. More drifts! <laughs> This transmission is a torque converter automatic, which has no business being in anything with a competition badge on it. However, I gotta say, it's really good. I mean, you can grab gears right in the middle of a drift and the shifts are so smooth, you can't even feel them. I mean, bitch all you want that that's a torque converter, but it works. Thank heavens the M3 is still available with a stick. But even I have to admit, the automatic works way better with this engine. I would have told you more about it, but I was interrupted by a lunatic in the middle of the racetrack. Randy, what's the matter? Jace, I saw a picture of that old VW Cabrio you have. It was up on two wheels in a corner. And I thought, if you put a little bit of toe out in the rear axle, it'll be better balanced and it'll be less likely to roll. What? After accusing Randy himself of being a little out of alignment, I did what any shithead YouTuber would do. I came up with an utterly absurd challenge. To show just how fast cars have come in the last 30 years, you need to race me in that. Jason, that sweet old classic is gonna have no chance against a car like that. Of course it will. I'm driving. That can make it worse. <laughs> Hey, Randy, about ready? Ready. I'm gonna need you to give me a very generous start. He's gonna need it. 
Uh, let's see, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, I don't know, 4,000. The E30 is a good handling little car. I love this car. And one of the things I love about it is that it talks to you. So many modern car companies are doing everything they can to take all the communication out to make the car easier to drive. Well, I have news for you. A car isn't really difficult to control when it talks to you, when it tells you what it's going to do. I wish car companies would take a lesson from that. I think I've reached the extent of my generosity. Generations, I didn't like them. They had a snap over steer. This car could do these sweet little drifts. This is the best handling BMW I've driven in 10 years. Yeah. The car is so satisfying to drive. Catch me if you can, Popes. And down to second for the second to final corner. <laughs> One thing holding this car back is the transmission programming. It won't get the right gear in a hairpin. Come on, it's pissing me off. We got him in our sights. Oh no, there he is, coming to get me. Sorry, Mr. E30 M3, I didn't mean any disrespect. Oh, you may not have meant to disrespect it, but you did. Whatever, I don't care. Look, I had more fun than you. I just love driving a slow car fast. Jason, you're driving a slow car slow. I went almost as fast in our camera car. Hang on, man. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, well, that's progress for you. And speaking of progress, look at these lap times. The M3 competition is the second fastest car we've ever tested around Thunderhill West. The only thing quicker? The base manual transmission M4. You can criticize the new M3 for being so big and so heavy, but it combines the livability of an M5 with everything an M3 should be. On track, without a question, this is the best M3 ever. And since Mercedes is putting a four-cylinder in the next C63, there's no competition in sight. So the horsepower war has a winner. Just please don't look at its face. All right, so you're gonna keep the Ferrari framed out the entire time, right? Yep. Perfect. Action. I'm not some rich YouTuber asking you to like and subscribe. Hey, up, 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 keep the Ferrari out. I'm an automotive journalist asking you to like and subscribe, and that's because that's how YouTube works. If you don't click those buttons, YouTube doesn't know that you like what you're seeing and won't show you any more of it. If you don't like what you're seeing, well, join the club. And by that, I mean the Haggerty Drivers Club, which gets you access to this award-winning magazine, as well as discounts on some pretty amazing stuff. And if, if you still don't like what you've seen, well, then leave a nasty comment because that's how the internet works. I gotta clean that up.